All right, so I'm going to be preaching uh, through the book of Ephesians, but I I probably won't do all six uh, chapters week after week, but um, I wanted to um, do a bit more expository preaching as well. So today we're going to start on Ephesians 1. I don't know how familiar you guys are with the book of Ephesians. It's a bit of a deep book. It's got some verses in there, obviously, that you know, very practical near like Ephesians 6 and whatnot. And then obviously we have one of our salvation verses in there, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, which we'll be looking at uh, next week. <coughs> um, Ephesians 1. So let's go through it and then you can get a bit more familiar with this book. The first chapter is a little bit complex, but when you break it down, uh, you can kind of see what he's talking about here in Ephesians 1. So first section I'm going to talk about is Paul's salutation, which is just his greeting at the beginning here. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Now, who are saints? You know, the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church have kind of made this word saints to be like these specific church fathers or, you know, apostles and whatnot, and there's only people that, uh, 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 like, approach sainthood. But in the Bible, like, we are all saints, I believe it's related to the fact that we're all priests of God. You know, our high priest is Jesus Christ. It's the priesthood of the believers. This is, a, this is like a Baptist doctrine, right? Where we don't believe like only, like in the Old Testament, there were priests, right? Which, were the, which if you remember, the priests were the line of Aaron. So you had the Levite tribe, and the Levite tribe was the one that, you know, worked in the temple. But Aaron and his sons were the priests, and there was always one high priest, right, who entered into the holy place once every year with blood, and that was the picture of Jesus Christ entering in with his own blood, we read in Ephesians, uh, sorry, in Hebrews. But we all are saints in the New Testament, right? It's the priesthood of the believers. So when we look at, like, say here, Romans 1, 7, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. So you see how saints are not just these specific people that just elevate up to like, you know, a certain uh, status, right? It's just every believer is a saint. Colossians 1, that, that's why when it talks about the tribulation of the saints, and when you read the saints in the Bible, it's just talking about believers. It's another way to refer to believers. To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ Jesus, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? So, Saints are not these people, like I said, that are just elevated to sainthood. They're also not people that we pray to. You know, we could get this from, uh, I don't know if the Orthodox do it, but the Catholics do it. They believe that, you know, great. So and they believe that, you know, because of the wedding of Cana, that they have to, like, go to Jesus, go to God through Mary, as though Mary is like this mediatrix. But sometimes they treat these saints as though they're like mediators too, like they can pray to these people. You know, like... People are not like God. The only reason why God can answer our prayers is because he's omniscient, right? When we die, we can't hear the prayers of other people. So, I mean, what are these saints? What are these people that are able to hear the prayers of other people? The only thing that they're doing is they're ascribing divine attributes to these people, which is, you know, blasphemous. So, saints are just believers. There is only one mediator between God and man, 1 Timothy 2. The man Christ Jesus. So why is he able to be? Because he is God in the flesh. You see, that's why there's one mediator. We don't need, you know, the Bible tells us in Hebrews that we can come boldly unto the throne of grace to find help in time of need. And why? Because we have this mediator. And it says in Hebrews, it not t- can't be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but it's all point tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So we have this mediator. It's not that you know, like the Catholics think that, you know, even Jesus is unapproachable, therefore you have to go to this other mediator that is approachable, which is Mary. No, Jesus is the approachable mediator that allows us to come boldly to God. So, you know, saints as well are not these mediators either. We only pray to God. But you can pray to Jesus because Jesus is God. Jesus is God in the flesh. All right, it's God. Ephesians 1, 2. Grace be to you in peace from God our Father <coughs> and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And sort of how I mentioned, you know, in James, where sometimes these salutations only mention the Father and Jesus Christ, because I don't think it is a reference to the first and second identity within the Trinity. I think this is referring to the divine nature and to the human nature, and this is why the Holy Spirit is generally left out of these salutations, because it's talking about God, the Spirit, and Jesus Christ, the man. Um, Even though you know, these sometimes are, are, can be interchangeable because of the Trinity. You, 
you, um, you, know, you have this you know, main use of God our Father talking about the Spirit, which is God in heaven, and the main use of Jesus Christ our Lord being the man Christ Jesus. Okay, so that's the salutation. Let's go on. The big, this is a big section, which is blessings from God. So now we go on to verse 3, all the way down to like verse 14, which is talking about the many blessings that we get from God, right? which is what Paul is going into. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And you know, sometimes when I think about the fact that God blesses us, the fact that God does things for us, you know, we, we almost take it for granted that, you know, we think, oh, well, that's God. I mean, of course he's going to bless us. You know, like, that's what God does. Isn't that one of the things that God does? It's just, you know, we just take it for granted that blessings from God just comes part and parcel with there being a God. But, you know, I think it's sometimes good for us to stop and consider that, you know, God doesn't really have to bless us with all these things. And he would still be a great God. But, you know, this God who is the creator of heaven and earth and just, you know, how majestic and mighty and great he is, is still willing to bless us as human beings. And, and as I think about that thought, it really reminds me of the psalm here when David, uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, says, you know, when I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man? that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man, that thou visitest him. What is he saying here when he considers how great the heavens are? And, you know, I don't deny the fact that the heavens, you know, these stars and these planets that are humongous. You know, the distances are, are very great. I, I'm somewhat sceptical that the distances are just like millions and billions of light years away and all this sort of stuff, because I, I think that's just playing into the whole, you know, long, you know, bigger, uh, what is it? Uh, old earth and millions of years and evolution. I think it's just playing into that. I don't think they can prove those things. But even if they're not millions and millions of light years away, I mean, even if a planet is one light year away, that's, that's still pretty damn far, you know? And e even if things are like very millions of miles across, it's still pretty big. So, you know, when we consider the heavens, that, you know, you look, sometimes you look up into the night sky, you think, oh, how far away these are, how many stars there are, how big they are. Uh, and you think God spoke these things into existence. He literally just spoke and created them. That's how, that's how powerful the God we worship is. And yet this God still has you on his mind. And this is, why this, this is what this verse is saying. This verse is saying that the God is so powerful, he's so big, He's so majestic. He's, he's bigger than anything that we could even imagine. You know, like we, we think about the ways of God. It's like the heavens is above the earth. It's like it's infinite. That, that's where we think space just goes on forever. We don't even know where it ends. Right? And yet this God is mindful of you as an individual. You know, like he knows your thoughts. He knows the hairs of your very head. And I think that's something that we can take great comfort in, that, that God is a personal God that knows us, that cares about us. And he's a God that blesses us. You know, it's not like we're not just a number to him. You know, we think about it in today's day and age, like people are not gods, you know, they can't know everything. It's the same with companies. Companies try and know everything about their customers, right? Governments try and know everything about their customers. You know, they try and do that because they're trying to make that personal relationship, but they can't. And ultimately, you are just a number to that company, right? Because they, they have to just pick you up in all these processes and systems and just like treat you as, you know, and, and, and try and make it feel personal. But God is not like that. God doesn't just have like millions and billions of people and, they, and we're just a number. He has the ability and the knowledge to be able to treat each one of us individually and have a relationship with each one of us. And I think that's something good to be reminded of, encouraged by, that God loves us enough that... He's mindful of us. Ephesians 1, 4, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he had made us accepted in the beloved. <clears throat> so we see that he's blessed us here, 
these verses are often used by Calvinists, right, who, who are trying to use these verses to say that God, you know, because one of the points of Calvinism is that God chooses who's saved and who isn't. And the way he does that, one way he does that is like, he, he gives people the ability to believe or not, right? And, and they try and use it. And, you know, when you just sort of read this and don't really think about what it's saying, you go like, oh, he's chosen us before the foundation of the world. He's like, oh, I can see how Calvinism fits there. Like, he's chosen us. Who's saved and who's not before the foundation of the world? But remember, Calvinism also means that he's chosen who hasn't, is not going to get saved before the foundation of the world. But is that even what Ephesians 1 is saying? Right? Because Ephesians 1 is not saying that he has chosen who is going to believe and who's not going to believe. He hasn't predestinated who will choose to believe and who won't choose to believe. What is Ephesians 1 actually saying? It's saying, according as he hath chosen us in him, before the foundation of the world, what has he chosen? That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Right, so what this verse is actually saying is that he, what he has predestinated or chosen, what he has pre-planned before the foundation of the world is those of us who are in him. Now, how do we get in Jesus Christ? Right? We get in Jesus Christ by believing on Jesus Christ. So this is where people get a bit confused because they think what's predestinated is the choice to be in Jesus Christ. That's not predestinated. Right? That is your choice. You choose whether to be in Jesus Christ, whether to be part of this nation. But God has, has ordained or he has plans for the people that are in Jesus Christ. Right? What are one of the plans? That they will be holy and without blame before him in love. The fact that those who believe on Jesus Christ will have their sins cleansed. Right? So that was a th something he planned before the foundation of the world. That to be holy and without blame before him in love. Having predestinated us unto... So what else is predestinated? Is it the fact that we are in him? No, it's the fact that those of us who are in him will be adopted, adoption of children by Jesus Christ himself according to the good pleasure of his will. You say like, well, isn't that the same as salvation? No, because he, we, we, he, we could have believed on Jesus Christ and not got these. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, we could believe on Jesus Christ. I mean, obviously this one we needs to happen because otherwise we can't be saved. But we didn't have to be treated as sons of God. We could just be servants. You know, so you see how like these blessings are blessings because they're not, they're not just automatic. It's that God blessed us by going, if you believe on Jesus Christ, you're going to be a son. You're not just going to be a servant. You see, so this is a blessing that we're tr treated as sons of God and not just as servants of God. And why did he do it? Well, it's for his glory and for his own pleasure, right? So the praise, praise of the glory of his grace where he had made us accepted in the beloved, right? So... This is not alluding to Calvinism, right? <clears throat> Jude uh, 24 says here, so like we talked about how he's presenting us, he's caught, he, he, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. I'm just going to show you the consistency here in Jude. It says, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. So this is one verse where it talks about us being presented faultless, this is this idea that this was a plan that was before the foundation of the world. It's the same when in Ephesians 5, husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So you see this plan to cleanse us was before the foundation of the world, but you only take part in that blessing of cleansing, if you make the choice to believe on Jesus Christ, right? So Romans 8 is another passage <coughs> where people try and use to support Calvinism being predestinated. But again, you can see here, it says, for whom he did foreknow, he, did, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So, you know, like Calvinists with like, the word predestination, they're a bit like the work salvationist with the word repentance. It's like, it's, like, it's like they see repentance in a verse and then they just stop reading the rest of the verse and they just see, there's repentance, right? So it's like with the Calvinists, they'll see like, ah, oh, see, it's predestination, of course it's predestination. Did you see the word there? It's predestination. But what is, what is being predestinated? Predestinate what? To be conformed into the image of his son. 
So again, like, you know, we have one, one thing that's predestinated is we're going to be cleansed and we're going to be blameless before God, right? Another thing is we're going to be adopted as sons. And another thing is those sons are going to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. So we are going to be sons conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, not just, I guess, different images, all right? So that's what he's talking about here, okay? So we see in Ephesians 1, 5, why did he do it? Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ according to the good pleasure of his will and to the praise of his glory. So he's told us why did he do this? Because he wanted to, it was his own pleasure, but it also brings him glory. Right? So this is where I think Calvinism goes wrong as well because you know, Calvinism teaches that God chooses who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. But how does God choosing who goes to hell bring him glory? Right? So if he wants to bring him, he wants, he wants pleasure from it, he wants it to bring him glory, how does it bring him glory by punishing those? Or how does it bring him pleasure by choosing those to punish? Right? Whereas the Arminian view is that we choose. So if we choose, it's our responsibility. Right? It doesn't bring God pleasure. If it was God's choice, why would he do something that doesn't bring him pleasure? Right? So we see here in Ezekiel 33:11. Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? So you see there in the Old Testament, and this is not part of the sermon, but in the Old Testament, you know, it talks about turning from your sins, but that was the Old Covenant, right? That's, that's, that's showing the Old Covenant in the Old Testament, because the way we turn from our sins in the New Testament, we've got to believe on Jesus Christ. That's how we get the righteousness which is by faith, not our own righteousness by doing good works. Okay, so I'm just stopping here in these Ephesians verses because these, these are like the main verses that Calvinists use. These are some of the main ones, but you can see here that it's quite clear in Ephesians. He's not predestinating us who believes and who doesn't. What you have to understand is what is predestinated is that there are plans that he's predestinated for those that will believe. Right? But it's our choice whether or not to believe or not. Okay, Ephesians 1.7. Let's go on. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. So another blessing we have is that we are bought back. To redeem something is when you buy it back. Right? So what does the blood do? So this might be getting a bit technical, but the blood is what buys us back. Right? So the picture there is that you know, like you have servants in the Old Testament and servants could be redeemed. We are like in bondage to sin. Right? So the picture there is that the blood of Christ buys our freedom right, from sin. Now some people think the blood of Christ is what satisfies God's wrath. That's not. What satisfies God's wrath is Jesus Christ's soul being the offering for sin. That's what made Jesus the propitiation for our sin. And there was this argument within our circle is like, well, what did the blood do versus what was the propitiation? And a lot of people who don't believe that Jesus Christ had to suffer in hell to satisfy the wrath of God thought that Christ spilling his blood, the blood was enough to satisfy God's wrath. But that's not what the blood does. The blood saves us because it redeems us from the bondage of sin, right? That's why it says, in whom we have redemption through his blood. Look at 1 Peter 1.18. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold. So you see how you're not bought back from bondage by corruptible things like the physical wealth of this world from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Okay, so that's the importance of the blood. The blood buys us back. You know, it redeems us. That's why it's in whom we have redemption through his blood. And I was trying to think, like, how do they justify this propitiation being through the blood? And I sort of saw this verse. I thought maybe this is the verse that they think about when they think about the blood being the propitiation. But it says, Who God had set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. So I think this is different because you, have, you put faith in his blood. So I think this phrase is referring to like, like putting your faith in the death, burial, and resurrection, and then him 
being the satisfaction of wrath on God, as opposed to redemption through his blood, the blood actually being the redemption. But obviously when we put our faith in that death, burial, and resurrection, we receive the propitiation. But I think the propitiation is actually satisfied by Jesus Christ's soul going to hell. Because what is a propitiation? I've explained this before, but a propitiation is when something is, is like satisfies somebody's wrath. So I used to think propitiation just means substitute, right? So Jesus Christ obviously is our substitute. He's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. But the fact that he suffered in hell, that was the wrath of God that came on him. And then that's why he satisfies that wrath. That's what propitiation is. Okay? Now let's continue. Ephesians 1.8. Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. So if you see these blessings that we're going through in Ephesians 1, he's blessed us, he's got all these plans for us, he's redeemed us through his blood, so we're no longer in bondage to sin. His other blessing is now he, he's like given us wisdom and prudence. Right? So, so you see how it's something to be grateful for. And this is why... Paul is praising God for these things because, you know, not only are we saved from hell, like we get all these blessings as well from God. And this is what Paul, in the book of Ephesians, is like revealing to us that, we, you know, we should be grateful for a lot of these things that come sort of part and parcel in being a saved believer. And God didn't have to do these, but yet he did. You know, he gave us, gave us his wisdom, prudent, having made known unto us the mystery of of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. You know, this reminds me of the verse in 1 Corinthians 2 when it talks about the wisdom of God. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I had not seen nor ear heard, neither entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him, but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. So you see, God didn't have to let us in on these things. He could have been a mysterious God that didn't tell us how things worked, what he was thinking, what his plans were, but no, he gave us his word. You know, he revealed to us these things. He didn't have to. It's a blessing to know the mind of God. It's like Jesus said to his disciples, like he's telling them what, what he's doing, because he was... He was they were his friends and he wanted to let them know what was going to happen you know he didn't need to and, and why is that different because in other religions it's like mysterious God you know like false religions you have no idea you know like what God's doing is like this mysterious force you know you got to try and figure out like what they're thinking or, or worse yet you have like like the Greek gods and the Roman gods which is just they're not even they're not even gods of integrity you know, just do what they want. They're going around being mischievous. That's why they're like devils. You know, just doing whatever they want. So, you know, God gives us his word. He lets us know his mind, and he's somebody with integrity, right, in terms of you cannot lie. So we know his word, and we can trust his word. That's something to be thankful for. Ephesians 1.10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. So what is he talking about here? And one day, the fullness of times, that means there's going to be a time when time is up, I guess, you know, the end is here, that this is talking about the rapture, right? When we're all gathered together in one place, both in heaven and on earth. So it's our our redemption, our new bodies. We've obtained an inheritance being predestinated. So you see how there's the blessing, there's the plans for us, there's our redemption, then there is the wisdom, the knowledge that he's given us so that we know his mind. And then this is looking to the future to say, like, look at this inheritance that we're going to inherit by being a believer on Jesus Christ. And one day we'll be all gathered. We'll be able to be with Jesus Christ and rule and reign with him. You know, this is sort of what he's, he's getting at here. So we receive these blessings through faith in Jesus Christ. All right? Um, let's go on. Ephesians 1.12. That we should be 
to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. So you see, now he goes on to like, well, how do we be part of these blessings? Right? And it comes back down to salvation. So you see how Ephesians 1, 4 and 5, talking about the plans, in the same chapter, he talks about how to actually be saved. Right? Which is that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. So you see that believing on Jesus Christ is now what gets you to be part of all these blessings. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth. So you see, it wasn't God that made them believe. It's like you trusted because you had to believe on Jesus Christ. After that, ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Right, so you see the steps here, that they heard the word of God, they believed the word of God, and then they received salvation. Right, they were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Right, and then all these blessings come. Right, so this reminds me of like Romans 10, 14, where you get those same steps of salvation. Right? How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? So you can see that it's they hear, they hear the word, then they believe on Jesus Christ, and then here it's like you call upon the name of the Lord to receive salvation. So it's here, <coughs> you believe after you heard the word of truth, and then you're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Right? And then that's when you start taking part in all these blessings. So we go on to verse 14 in Ephesians 1. It says, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So what is this saying here? This is saying, what's an earnest? So when you say, like, when you do something in earnest, people kind of think you're doing things honestly, right? But when it, when it comes to earnest, this is a phrase or a word to do with like a, like a, like a down payment. Like when you do the earnest, it's like the initial payment. So what is he saying here? Which is the earnest? What is he referring to? The Holy Spirit of promise? Receiving the Holy Spirit is like the down payment, the initial payment of our inheritance. But it's called an earnest because it's, you know, it's like a deposit. It's like you're saying, I'll give you a deposit because I... And being earnest about paying you the rest. You know, kind of thing. I'm putting it down to show you I want to reserve because I'm going to buy, I'm going to buy it. You know, and that's why you lose your deposit if you don't end up buying it, right? But here, this, the, the Holy Spirit of promise is God showing to us that we will be redeemed completely because we've been given the Holy Spirit, which is the earnest of our inheritance Right, so that's the first initial payment of everything that we're going to receive until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So you see how you get that earnest by believing on Jesus Christ and believing on Jesus Christ then gets you this inheritance and these blessings and the Holy Spirit is like that reminder that God will do these things until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So it's interesting that it's like, it's like a double buy here. You see that? It's the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchase possession. Isn't that like, it's like, it's like you, you are buying something that you've already purchased? Why is, why is that? Well, I'll explain. <laughs> so the redemption, so what is this referring to? Because see, he's redeemed us through his blood. So we're already a purchased possession when we believe on Jesus Christ because we've been bought back from the bondage of sin. But there's going to be another redemption, right? The other redemption is at the resurrection, right? Romans 8, look at this. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, right? So that's the earnest of our inheritance, the Spirit. Even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, look at this, to wit, the redemption of our body. See, so I think what's going on here is you have redemption through his blood, which is like believe on Jesus Christ, you get the Spirit, you're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. 
You're no longer in bondage to sin. You've been bought. You know, you can serve a new master, right? But there's going to be another redemption, which is the redemption of our body, right? And that's when physically we are adopted. So remember there was that plan to be adopted as sons? That's at this point. But because we're going to be adopted as sons, John, 1 John tells us, hey, you know, you know we, we, are, we get treated now as the sons of God, thankfully, even though we are not fully sons of God. We are only sons of God in the spirit. Okay, so this is why he says here the redemption of the purchased possession because I think we're already purchased and then one day we will be complete, completely redeemed. Right? So don't get confused with, you know, sometimes people will get caught up because they think, are we getting saved now or getting saved later? Right? And no, we are saved now. Right? But it's just that the, 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 the steps... I don't really want to call it steps of salvation because we don't believe in a like, process to get saved. We just believe on Jesus Christ. But I'm saying that once we're saved, like there are these other things that are going to happen, right? And you don't want to get mixed up that these other things are going to happen, therefore salvation is a process. It's not, right? It's, and this is why this is the earnest of our inheritance because once we believe on Jesus Christ, we have the earnest of the inheritance. We know that we will take part in all the others. And this is why salvation happens in a moment. But why does the Bible talk about this other redemption, this, this salvation of our bodies? Because it, it's like our salvation is not completely done yet in the sense that when we get saved, we're only first saved in the spirit, but then one day we will get a new body. Okay? <coughs> now let's go on to the last bit, which is verse 15 to the end is Paul's prayers. So up until verse 14, you've got the salutation and you've got all these blessings that we're going to take part in. Right? Now we get on to like Paul's prayers for the Ephesians. Ephesians 1.15 Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. You see how Paul like, was not just an evangelist. He wasn't just an active Christian. I mean, he prayed for the believers. And do you pray for the believers? You know, like that's why we got that uh, prayer list printed now. You know, if you are not in the habit of praying, like why don't you take one? You know, put it on your desk, put it in front of you so that sometimes you may look at it and think to pray for one another. You know, like put your prayer requests on the list so people can pray for you. But also use the list so you can pray for others. You know, Paul, I know in another passage, I don't have this passage in it today, but he, he says, I think it's in Ephesians, where he says, God is my witness, how I long for you all. You know, and it's not about like showing others how much you pray, you know, and being like a Pharisee. It's about, does God know that you pray for others? We give thanks to God and the Father of, of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. So Paul was a, was a praying Christian, prayed for his brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, do you pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ? Ephesians 1.17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us when we believe according to the working of his mighty power. So what is, what is Paul praying for here? So you say, Paul prays for his brothers and sisters in Christ. But then it goes on to say, these are the things that he prays for for them. And you can break this down. That, that the, the Father of glory may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Right? So that's one thing he's praying for, that they will know what God wants. Right? Like give them knowledge, give them wisdom. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. This is why I love the way this is phrased in Ephesians 1. It's like it's, like it's not enough to just know it, it's like he wants their eyes to be opened. 
It's like he wants the light bulb to come on for them. Because you, know, you can know it, you can understand it, but it's like, it, it, I don't know how you can explain it, but it's like, is it, have you internalized it? You know, has the light bulb, have you had the light bulb moment? You know, has it really gone into the heart where you're like, this, this matters to me? What, what is it? What does he want them to understand and be enlightened about that you may know what is the hope of his calling? What is this? Your mission, your purpose. You know, have you internalized this? This is what Paul is praying for. He's praying that people will get why they're here for. You know, what's your main goal, your main mission? The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his call. And what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. To me, that's like your reward. You know, is your reward in heaven? Are you laying up treasures in heaven or are you laying up treasures upon earth? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us where do we believe? That to me is like your ability that he's enabled you to do great things for him. Do you realize this? You know, sometimes people have this defeatist attitude. But no, he's saying here, I hope you understand, I hope your eyes are enlightened that God has this great mission for you, that you can get these great rewards in heaven and that he's enabled you to do these great things for him according to the working of his mighty power. Right? So it's very similar to Philippians 3.10. See, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. So he's like saying, I know him, Jesus, I want to have the wisdom and the knowledge, the power of his resurrection, there's the ability to, to overcome, and the fellowship of his suffering, right? There's the rewards there. You know, when you suffer with Jesus Christ, you want to reign with him. Being made conformable unto his death. See, not being conformed to this world, but conforming to the image of Jesus Christ. Your purpose in life is to live a godly life and to be like Jesus Christ. Right? So it's the same thing here. He's constantly praying me for the Philippians, for the Ephesians, to understand their goal, their mission in life, and that God has enabled them to do it. Ephesians 1, let's finish off here at our verse 20, verse 23. So, I mean, let's pray for that, for each other. You know, I mean, first, I, I, pr I hope you pray for it for yourself. You know, do you, do you sometimes pray to God and say, you know, God, like, like get a hold of my heart. Make me take the things of God seriously. Remind me of my purpose. And then maybe you'll pray the same for others. You know, maybe you don't, you don't pray the same for others because you haven't prayed the same for yourself yet. And get that desire to want to serve God, to do great things for God. And then maybe you have that desire for others to do great things for God too. Ephesians 1.20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. So what's going on in these last couple of verses? He talked about the power we have in Christ and now he's talking about how exalted Christ will be above everything. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion. He's talking about how high and lifted up Jesus is. And every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. That's how glorified the name of Jesus is, that it's high above everything, high above every name in this world, high every name that is in the world to come. And has put all things under his feet and give him, gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So a few things here. We see the church is the body of Christ. We see here that Christ is the head of the church. We see that Christ is lifted up, not only in the church, but he's lifted up amongst everything. Right? So that's why he's lifted up against everything. Verse 21, far above all principality, power, might, dominion, every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Now, I want to just finish on this point about the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> because, you know, when, when all this Trinity stuff was going down, there was an argument over, like, what is the name of God? And what will we call God <coughs> when we meet him? And I believe that name is Jesus. You know, so that was one thing that was a bit, some people found controversial, was that I don't, I don't have a problem with the name of the Father, the name of God being Jesus. 
right? And, and because that's the name above every name. That's that. If, we, if we're going to call God by any name in the new world, would it be a name that is lesser than the name that is above every name, not only in this world, but in also that which is to come? I mean, that doesn't make sense to me. So you know, in Revelation, it tells us here, I'm just going to skip over Revelation 4, it tells us here in Revelation 22, 4, that God's name will see God and his name shall be in their foreheads. Right? So what is this name that will be in our foreheads? I think it's going to be Jesus. But I also think Revelation tells us it's going to be Jesus. But let me show you here Revelation 22, 4. So Revelation 22 starts off, I'm just going from verse 4. They shall see his face and his name shall be in their foreheads. So this is talking about the Lord God, right? Because the Lord God is in Revelation sitting on that throne, right? They can't really see him, but one day we're going to see his face. And his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. So we're going to have the name, the Lord God, in our foreheads. Right? We're going to see him face to face. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servant the things which must shortly be done. Right? Notice there, the Lord God, the one, we're going to have his name in our foreheads, we're going to see his face. And in this verse, what did the Lord God do? He sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. So what's his name? Look, read down to verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. So who is the Lord God? What is his name? It's Jesus. And I think it lines up with this saying in Ephesians, where it says here, far above all principality and power, right? and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. The name of Jesus is the name above all names. You know, to think that we would have a name in our foreheads that is less than the name of Jesus does not make sense to me at all. But I also think that Revelation shows us that the name of the Lord God in Revelation is Jesus because he's the same one that sent the angel. All right. So I hope you learned something there today. Right, so what did we learn? Ephesians, we are all saints. You believe on Jesus Christ, we get all these blessings. You know, don't forget to thank God for the blessings that he gives you, the wisdom, the inheritance, the salvation, the cleansing, you know, the power to live a victorious Christian life, to overcome, to do great things for God. And, you know, Jesus Christ is worthy. He's worthy of your service, and he's enabled you to do great things for him. All right, let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your greatness. And we thank you for enabling us through your grace and through your power. We pray, Lord, that you will enlighten our eyes, you will open our eyes to the hope of, our, of your calling. And that when we know you, the, the fellowship of your suffering and the power of your resurrection, help us, Lord, to, to serve you with our full might. Help us to use our life um, for your service, we pray in Jesus' name.